Good morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the, the uh, National Bureau of Asian Research and New Zealand and Mr. Dean's co-hosted seminars on the opportunities and challenges in the U.S., Japan, and America. I'm Kasui Chinchida, uh, President of USJI and also Vice President of our Central University. As you know, USJI is a non-profit research institute here in Washington, D.C., organized by eight leading Japanese universities and financially supported by both U.S. Japan and Asian societies. The mission of USJI is to promote policy-related uh, research at our member universities, to organize research teams, uh, dispatch their results uh, to a wider community by, me by me the medium of English, and to nurture young researchers uh, relating to U.S. Japan issues, and to formulate a community of researchers and policy makers. Since the establishment of USJI in, uh, September, uh, in uh, April 2009, we hold a week-long seminar twice a week, twice a year, in March and September. And this time, from today to uh, Wednesday next week, we will have uh, altogether 11 uh, events. I hope you will be able to attend as many as, as possible. And today, as you know, Prime Minister Abe reshuffled his cabinet. And I understand among 18 cabinet members, nine are graduate of our member universities. And uh, so three from Keio, one from Kyoto, two from Tokyo, three from Waseda. And recently, USJI have, has uh, collaborated uh, with NBR. And for example, last February in Tokyo, we had uh, a joint seminars on adapting to new energy areas. And the USJI is very fortunate and very pleased to collaborate with NBR. The topic of today's, or well, this morning, is opportunity and challenge in the US Japan alliance. Two distinguished speakers uh, Professor Hiroshi Nakanishi, Professor of Kyoto Universities, and also uh, uh, Dr. Michael Green, Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chairs, uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I understand that uh, they are going to discuss, uh, we are going to discuss many uh, uh, wide ranges of issues, like the uh, collective civil defense rights, and economics, and uh, uh, relations with neighboring countries like China, Korea, and Russia, and so on. And I'm quite sure that today's discussion will be very stimulating and also thoughtful as well, and we produce a fruitful and productive result. And we were introducing uh, Mr. Abraham Denberg, Vice President for Political and Security Affairs in VR. I would like to ask to receive your permission of videotaping of this seminars and also open to public through the internet. Okay, thank you for your permission. So, uh, Mr. Aura. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming this morning. My name is Abe Denmark uh, from the National Bureau of Asian Research. Um, I'm going by Abraham during this just um, because if I go by Abe, things get very confusing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Abraham is for this one. Um, we're very thankful to uh, Uchida Sensei and to USJI for partnering again with us. It's a very fruitful relationship that we've developed with USJI. Um, we're also very thankful to both Professor Mike Amishi and Dr. Green um, for coming and speaking with us this morning. I should mention that in addition to his duties at CSIS, uh, Dr. Green is also an associate professor at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Um, our, what we'll be doing today is that both Professor Nakanishi and Dr. Green will be giving presentations of about 15 minutes, um, at which point I'll open a, a moderated Q&A session. And, um, my attitude with these when I have two tremendous experts on the U.S.-Japan alliance, my role is to facilitate and otherwise get out of the way. Um, so with that, I will ask uh, Professor Nakanishi uh, to give his presentation. Uh, 
thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, USGI and uh, LBAR uh, for uh, giving me this wonderful opportunity to, to share uh, this, uh, the, one of the kickoff uh, uh, sessions of this USGI week event. Uh, because of the time limitations, I just uh, go quickly over uh, my PowerPoints, which deal more uh, or less the general assessment of the uh, Abe cabinet and its domestic as well as foreign policy, uh, not specifically on the US Japan alliance. Uh, of course, it's inclu included, but uh, uh, it kind of you know, deals with more broad foreign and security policy issues uh, as well as domestic and economics, economics type. Uh, type of team, and uh, I let uh, uh, Dr. Green to uh, to uh, talk more deeply on uh, US Japan Alliance, and uh, I uh, because I'm uh, I flew in just yesterday, I'm kind kind of having the uh, jet lag yet uh, still, so uh, I uh, I like to uh, take as many questions as possible later, uh, but. Uh, I hope the difficult questions are left to uh, the uh, later uh, sessions of this USGI week because they are more wonderful speakers coming in from Japan. Anyway, uh, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the uh, under the title of the second chapter of the Abe cabinet. Uh, just uh, it was mentioned, like it was mentioned, uh, uh, Abe Prime Minister Abe reshuffled his, his cabinet. Uh, the e, six members are staying, as far as I remember. Uh, Twelve are uh, res, uh, new uh, recruits to the cabinet. And there are many uh, speculations and talks and assessments. And I don't want to go into those things in detail right now, but uh, 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 the, this cabinet reshuffle uh, seems to kind of coincide with the, the change of the uh, of the step uh, the uh, Abe cabinet has been uh, undergoing. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the past uh, half and uh, one and a half year uh, was the, the first uh, stage of the second Abe cabinet, which was generally successful, I think. Uh, but the, uh, this, uh, from uh, this cabinet sh sh uh, reshuffle, uh, the second chapter, as uh, Mr. Uh, Abe also called, is, is starting, and uh, I think uh, generally uh, the uh, tasks and challenges are uh, more uh, uh, deep and more difficult uh, compared to the first chapter of this uh, second public cabinet. Hmm. Well, uh, uh, everyone talks about the change of Japanese uh, politics after uh, this second uh, cabinet. And that's true uh, that uh, this uh, Abe cabinet is, uh, is already showing the different pattern to the uh, last six re revolving uh, prime ministries. Uh, it's, more, uh, it's much closer to the Koizumi cabinet's pattern in terms of the uh, cabinet support ratio uh, and, and so forth, uh, the stability. Uh, but, uh, but I think the real turning point of Japanese politics as well as economy and society was rather uh, uh, from 2009 to 2011, uh, rather than to, uh, from uh, 2013 last year, uh, because uh, ar ar around that time, Japanese people's uh, sentiment <laughs> and perception uh, really changed uh, uh, because of the serious sense of crisis and decline, uh, the fear of decline, uh, the uh, economic crisis in 2009 and the uh, 2010 uh, Senkaku fishing boat incident with China. And then 2001, naturally, 311, a uh, great aspect. Those things uh, changed uh, the perception of the Japanese people uh, from uh, the period of Koizumi, uh, when the reform was the real keyword, buzzword of the Japanese politics. Uh, but uh, then it changed towards the uh, current buzzword of regaining, Torimodosu. Uh, that was the keyword uh, Abe uh, used in his campaign uh, again, uh, in, in the general election. And uh, that really hit the mood of the Japanese public, I think, because uh, Japanese people came to, to worry more about the losing uh, of what uh, they bought uh, in uh, late Showa period or the early Heisei period. So, uh, regain Japan a message it really it hit the mood, but uh, it, it was not simply because of Abe, uh, but it, it was more uh, deeply 
be related to the change of the uh, sense of the people. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, compared to the previous DPJ uh, cabinets, uh, the, this second uh, uh, Abe cabinet's success so far uh, seems to be obvious. The, the, the biggest success is naturally uh, the so-called economics. Uh, it uh, changed the uh, yen from uh, 80 yen per dollar to 100 uh, uh, yen to dollar. Uh, and the Nikkei index uh, 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 jumped up from uh, about 8,000 yen to 15,000 yen or even more uh, today. Uh, so uh, the economic turnaround is, uh, is obviously the, the biggest uh, change uh, from the previous uh, cabinets. Uh, and the, uh, not, uh, no doubt Abe became much more seasoned and veteran uh, prime minister compared to his first uh, unsus unsuccessful prime ministership. Uh, his improved management of appointing people or agenda setting, uh, which is uh, much more skillful and mastery uh, compared to the first cabinet. Uh, sadly, the active and foreign security policy, uh, as I did uh, 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 talk a little bit more, uh, the so-called Global Panoramic Diplomacy Security of Council GAIKO, or the so-called Active Pacifism uh, 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 Security Behavior Shugi, those uh, things were not only words, but uh, uh, supported by his deeds. Uh, fourth, uh, the opposition is really weak and scattered. Uh, the DPJ is uh, in, the, in, in a drawdown, and even the third, uh, third uh, sectors like uh, Restoration Party or others are uh, in very weak position. So on, on the sphere there is uh, no uh, big challenger outside the LDP uh, looking uh, to uh, have it. And fifth, uh, he, was, he has been lucky. He, uh, like uh, last year's winning of the Tokyo Olympic of 2020, uh, partly because of his uh, or, plan, uh, or other cabinet's uh, effort, but generally it was more of the lack uh, on, on, on other side, and uh, uh, it really it shut up people's mind. <coughs> well, uh, on security policy, uh, which I generally uh, think highly of uh, as the uh, uh, as already an achievement by uh, the second other cabinet, uh, he established a set of he has done uh, like establishing a uh, Japanese NSC uh, with secret protection law, uh, which means the stronger coordination and intelligence handling uh, within the uh, government as well as with the United States and other possible uh, friendly powers. Then uh, uh, the Cabinet cabinet issued the first national security strategy last year and revised the defense guideline and midterm defense program, which was set in uh, late 2010 by DPJ uh, government. And thirdly, uh, uh, the, this cabinet revised the defense equi equipment principles, which was partially revised also by DPJ, but uh, the uh, other cabinet formalized the, uh, chain, uh, the uh, changing the uh, uh, severe restriction on uh, arms sales or the uh, joint development of uh, arms with uh, foreign countries. Uh, fourthly, uh, as it, is, it has been mentioned, uh, he, he, he uh, took care of the uh, long-standing uh, issue of the uh, constitutional uh, ban on the right of collective self-defense, and he changed the, uh, cap uh, uh, the constitution int interpretation by a uh, cabinet decision. All those are the, uh, the uh, issues which were around for uh, about 10 years. So uh, all these things are not new in initiatives. Uh, but uh, I think Abe uh, successfully done uh, uh, these uh, 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 reforms as the you know late hallmark uh, turning in, uh, and I think it was good. And uh, global foreign policy, uh, the Abe, uh, foreign, uh, the foreign policy linchpin of the Abe is naturally the alliance with the United States. Uh, like I said, collective defense or the uh, uh, President Obama's uh, explicit commitment on Sankar. <laughs> Uh, uh, islands or the TPP, all those things are uh, key uh, areas. And the, the uh, two plus two uh, uh, relationship with uh, other countries than the United States. Uh, other than the United States, uh, Japan has had uh, two plus two relationship with Australia before this second Abe cabinet, but uh, the Abe cabinet studied the two plus two with Russia, uh, France, and recently India. Uh, so, uh, kind of not ally, but uh, the, the untamed or friendly relationship with other countries are in, in, increasing. Uh, 
Sadly, defense equipment arrangement, like I said, defense uh, arms export uh, is widened uh, by uh, becoming it. And so there's an agreement with the UK, Australia, uh, France, India, etc. Uh, fourthly, the uh, the core area uh, of the Japanese foreign policy is towards Southeast Asia, uh, ASEAN is uh, uh, the, uh, supplanting the American people to, uh, to the Pacific is one of the key areas uh, this uh, government is trying to, uh, to put efforts. Uh, provision of patrol ships uh, to Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, all those things are uh, have been done since uh, DPJ, uh, but uh, Abe government is more, more uh, forthcoming. And also, Abe visited uh, 47 countries already uh, by this August. Uh, uh, the, uh, this is the second to Koizumi, who did a 48 country visit in five, five, more than five years. So, uh, uh, no doubt, uh, Abe will set the record of visiting countries. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the, this second chapter, as I mentioned, uh, just, uh, may be uh, much, uh, may be more difficult than the first period of this second army cabinet. Well, uh, the last year, uh, people generally uh, had a, a nice time, uh, you know, winning the Tokyo Olympic and other, you know, uh, uh, good news in the economy or the uh, foreign policy and so forth. Uh, but uh, from now on, we have to go uh, come, uh, look at the reality, and the, you know, regain Tonimoto's message needs to be backed up by reality. Uh, but uh, where, uh, what kind of reality we, we can uh, regain? Uh, obviously, one mm, uh, direction uh, Abe seems to be heading is a bigger, faster show up. These two pictures uh, from the internet, of what, uh, the, the, uh, the one uh, on the uh, left upper is the new national stadium, which is supposed to be built uh, by 2019, uh, before the, uh, 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 before the uh, uh, Tokyo Olympic, but it's a huge construction. It's uh, nearly as big as the Bazinest Stadium of Beijing, uh, and uh, it's a mobile roof uh, construction, and many Japanese architects are questioning its feasibility. But still, it's, it's going on. The uh, lower uh, 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 left side uh, is the picture of the, the so-called linear Shinkansen, linear uh, bullet train, uh, which is, has been uh, studied by Japanese uh, 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 JL uh, for a long time, but uh, now JL Toka is trying to, to uh, establish uh, this uh, uh, between Shinagawa and Nagoya uh, by 2027. It's also a huge investment, like uh, 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 more than uh, <coughs> 5 trillion yen uh, for uh, 12 years. So uh, it's, it's technically feasible, probably, but economically feasible or not, there is a uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, so, uh, one way of, uh, you know, uh, Abe saying that uh, we, Toyota's uh, Japan, we regain Japan, maybe uh, the good memory of 1964. Uh, we had the Shinkansen, Tokai Shinkansen, and the uh, 1964 Olympic. Maybe we have better, faster, uh, improved uh, uh, 1964. Uh, but is it feasible? Uh, Coming challenges, uh, uh, already we are uh, discussing the future of abenomics and the uh, consumption tax raise, which is supposed to happen uh, next year, October next year, from 8% uh, to 10%. Then uh, other cabinet uh, needs to face up the nuclear power plant restart issue uh, from the end of this year to uh, early next year. Uh, then there are some local elections, Fukushima governor election and Okinawa governor election and unified local elections uh, from uh, this uh, autumn to uh, early next year. Then uh, the, promise, uh, the balancing between diplomacy and domestic politics is uh, uh, also a serious issue, particularly on the issue of North Korea, China, Republic of Korea and Russia. 
Of course, Abe had some strong cards, uh, like uh, he had a wide discretion of timing of the general election. Uh, the general election is supposed to happen uh, by uh, late 2016, uh, but uh, probably uh, from around uh, next uh, summer uh, to uh, the, uh, 2016, uh, he has uh, many options, uh, and uh, there is uh, no significant challenger right now uh, to his leadership, even within the ODP, uh, just after the cabinet reshuffle. And the secondly, uh, North Korea bureaucracy investigation is going on by the, the North Korean government. And we, uh, I mean, Japan public don't know any information about that. But maybe he, he or the cabinet uh, top members have some good information to uh, provide. Uh, maybe he, Mr. Abe is uh, trying to imitate uh, Mr. Komizumi's surprise visit to uh, Pyongyang in 2002 uh, to give up his uh, cabinet support. Uh, thirdly, uh, GPIF reform, it's a bit technical, but the big pension fund uh, may be starting buying more uh, uh, shares uh, to, to sort of, you know, uh, uh, move up the share price, share index prices. Uh, fourthly, uh, possibly the improvement of the relationship with China and the Republic of Korea. Uh, but it's, it's, there is a KB. Uh, the Japanese public generally supports the improvement with those two countries, but with conditions. Uh, the condition means that uh, Japan should not uh, make too big concessions to have improvements. That's the you know, general public uh, perception. So there is a kind of you know, uh, KB on this. Abenomics, I, I just mentioned Abenomics uh, a little bit more. Uh, the, the, uh, until the first quarter of this year, it's uh, it been generally going well. It was like 6.1% uh, per year growth. But the second quarter, because of the consumption tax rates from 5% to 8%, it uh, went down 6.8%. Uh, now the debate is whether the, this is just temporary effect of the consumption tax, and so wait for the natural recovery, or uh, the, the consumption is still weak, so we need new stimulus, like another uh, Nichigen uh, BOJ, uh, uh, Governor Kroda's bazooka, uh, big financial boost, or the national resilience package, the, like big fiscal investment. Or uh, alternatively, there is a weak supply, a shortage of labor, uh, export uh, 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 capabilities uh, declining. Uh, then we need structural reform. Uh, the the sad of what uh, Mr. Abe called. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, those are you know uh, all now being debated. Uh, so the economics uh, has a kind of you know. Uh, recess period, whether we can go far or maybe we need some, you know, revision uh, is uh, something uh, now being discussed. Um, in my view, uh, the regaining of the big, big efforts to uh, show up is uh, not a uh, right solution. I think uh, a kind of new reform is necessary, particularly on the field of the demography and family, agriculture, social security, resilience, all those things, uh, but it's uh, it's very difficult to come up with the uh, regaining and the reforming uh, balance. So uh, generally, I think this uh, second uh, Abe cabinet, I mean the second cabinet of the second Abe cabinet, uh, uh, must be more careful in, in handling the uh, various uh, economic and social issues uh, than the first uh, cabinet. Lastly, I talk about the uh, uh, foreign policy. Japan and the U.S. Uh, basically, security defense is on track. Uh, new defense guideline with the U.S. is uh, prepared by the, will be prepared by the end of this year, and the, Japan is uh, in to increasing, uh, you know, not really big, uh, but uh, increasing trend of defense capability like buying Ospreys, Global Hawks, or uh, building uh, new copter carriers, amphibious uh, units, and so such and such. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the more contentious area is the TPP negotiation and possibly the policy toward Russia. Japan is awaiting for, still awaiting for the uh, uh, President Putin's visit in uh, November uh, this year. And uh, possibly in Australia, if the abduction issue uh, go for us, uh, uh, that may cause a kind of uh, 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 
friction between uh, uh, US, uh, Korea, and Japan on, on uh, the approach towards North Korea. But the bigger issue is, of course, Japan-China relationship. Uh, the, this November APEC at Beijing is a great opportunity for RBMC to uh, have uh, the first uh, uh, leaders summit. Uh, but the conditions is, of course, the uh, whether Japan admits the same fact uh, as territorial dispute, or from Japanese side, if, if there is a working relationship on accidental prevention, uh, particularly on the in, in maritime or the uh, over sea areas. The second uh, issue is the Yasukuni visit. Whether uh, uh, Abe explicitly denies going to Yasukuni anymore, uh, uh, that kind of issues are there. But I, I would like to mention a general trend of Japan shifting away from China. Of course, it's a, it's not a you know a fundamental shift. But uh, compared to a few years back trend that Japan, uh, Japanese particularly business and economy is moving into China, the trend is uh, uh, that uh, we are uh, seeing more risks on Chinese economic market, environmental hazard, uh, wage increase. Uh, shadow banking and real estate bubbles, uh, those things generally it turns uh, down to the uh, sentiment of the Japanese businesses, except uh, not, not only the political uh, row, but all these uh, uh, economic and the social conditions uh, may be changing Japanese minds, uh, minds uh, towards China. Then uh, Japan and uh, Korea. Uh, of course, the, the, uh, again, the political history issue uh, on uh, particularly comfort women issue is important, uh, but uh, from my viewpoint, that's not the root cause of the, uh, the current relationship between two countries. There are more structural changes. Uh, firstly, uh, both countries, uh, Japan and Korea, went a uh, fundamental political change in the last 20 years towards democratization and social opinion uh, uh, influences the uh, foreign policy of two countries. Uh, second, secondly, uh, Korea and Japan has kind of strategic alienation. Uh, Japan is basically going towards the south, uh, I mean maritime areas, Southeast Asia, Australia, South, South Asia, uh, while the Republic of Korea is looking uh, more on the north, I, I mean China, Russia, and of course North Korea. Uh, so that kind of strategic uh, geopolitical uh, alienation, as well as economic change, that uh, uh, previous uh, economic complementarity towards uh, change towards more of the competitive relationship between two countries. So uh, even setting aside the comfort women issue, uh, Japan and uh, relationship needs to be based on a different ground from the Cold War period. Well, uh, I, I think I uh, over uh, talked uh, already, uh, uh, even though I couldn't uh, go into uh, so, uh, much details. So I, I wait for easy questions from different <laughs> ones for uh, Green or the latest speakers in this uh, uh, USGI speak uh, week. Thank you. So um, I want to thank uh, USGI and uh, the uh, NBR and uh, my good friend Abe, excuse me, Abraham, <laughs> um, for inviting me and for hosting this today. Uh, 25 years ago, I was a student at Tokyo University under Sato Sezaburo. I was working in the diet. Um, and I was doing research for my dissertation on the US-Japan alliance. <clears throat> and um, the prevailing mood and the dominant uh, thesis of almost all of my fellow PhD candidates from the U.S. studying in Japan was that in this new post-Cold War era, because I was in Japan as the Berlin Wall was coming down um, when President Bush Sr. declared the end of the Cold War in Malta, and the prevailing theme from almost all of my classmates and senior scholars studying in Japan from the U.S. was that uh, in the future, the United States and Japan would diverge, that the new global competition was going to be based on techno-nationalism, that our major adversary was going to be Japan, that public opinion polls in the U.S. showed that a majority of Americans were now more afraid of the Japanese economy than Soviet nuclear missiles, 
<coughs> the um, defense planning guidance in 1991-92 said the U.S. had to prepare to prevent the uh, arrival of pure competitors pointing to China, India, um, Germany, and especially Japan. <coughs> and that basically I was a moron to be studying the U.S.-Japan alliance because it was going to end up on the ash heap of history. Um, so I came back to Washington, uh, stubbornly continuing my research. I met Jed Snyder, who invented, who probably thought I was a strange alien creature in the context of the times, and invited me to give a talk on my, on my dissertation. Um, the Cold War ended, and a lot of political scientists who were doing their dissertations were really quite lost. There was a famous encounter at Harvard when the uh, eminent uh, historian of the Soviet Union, Robert Conquest, met with a group of Harvard students, and a political science candidate said, I'm just finishing my dissertation on political science. Political science is supposed to be able to predict things scientifically. No one predicted the end of the Cold War. What should I do? And Robert Conquest said, you should switch your major to history. <laughs> um, a lot of my colleagues were furiously doing their next predictive act. Instead of becoming humble by the end of the Cold War, they decided they would redouble their efforts to come up with new theories, um, to be more predictive, and most of the predictions were in the late 80s, early 90s, that um, in Asia we were heading towards confrontation with Japan, that Japan was diverging from the US. And I mention this because um, I'm still a political scientist. Um, I'm a little bit like a Christian in 17th century Japan. I worship the political science Shinto shrines, but then I quietly go home to look at my historical icons and worship history. <clears throat> um, but I mention it because I think to understand where we are, really, in the US-Japan alliance today, we need to think in time. We need, to, we need to look at the historical evolution of the debates in both countries and, and where we are. And it's really pretty remarkable if you wind back the clock 20, 25 years and look at what people thought was going to happen with this alliance. And I would argue that um, the last uh, few decades, and in, in reality the whole history of the US-Japan alliance, is a history of the steady um, triumph of the realists uh, in the US, uh, and in Japan. Let me start with the U.S. There's um, a long history of American strategic thinking about Asia, uh, much longer than most people recognize, going back to the 18, uh, early 1800s. And um, dominated by the U.S. Navy in many respects. <clears throat> and people like Commodore Perry, who came back from Japan in the mid-1850s, made speeches saying that our future position in Asia is going to have to be built around a relationship with Japan. And Perry said in a speech in New York, the Japanese are a rational people who would be more open to conviction than their neighbors, the Chinese, over whom in almost every essential aspect they hold vast superiority. I'm playing the audience a bit here. Um, and he warned, although he was a deeply uh, religious and Christian man, he warned the United States should not approach Japan as a Christian teacher but instead as an honorable and friendly partner, understanding that Japanese civilization was going to adopt Western norms and become a source of stability uh, against the uncertainty of the Slavs, uh, the Chinese, and other continental powers. Um, Alfred Thayer Mahan, who was something of a protege of Perry's and became probably the most important American strategic thinker at the turn of the century, another naval officer, um, also saw Japan as the linchpin for American uh, strategy in Asia and for preserving a peaceful Pacific. And he saw the Japanese, as Perry did, as more civilized and more open to Western civilization. But again, like Perry said, we should not try to tell Japan what to do. Um, and he saw the balance of power in the Pacific resting on an alignment of the United States, Japan, and Great Britain, including, of course, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, which were part of the British Empire. Uh, in the post-war period, George Cannon also made similar arguments about the importance of Japan and the offshore island chains and alignment and protection of Japan's industrial heartland as the counterpart to protecting the industrial heartland of Western Europe to make sure that the Atlantic and Pacific don't become uh, open to threats from hostile continental powers. And in, in many respects, the sort of penultimate moment in this maritime strategic realism came in the Reagan administration when Reagan saw Japan as part of the West, invited Nakasone to be a central uh, partner in 
the strategies of the Cold War and the Williamsburg Summit in 1983, and Nakasone reciprocated by calling Japan an unsinkable aircraft carrier and uh, making the Japanese archipelago as um, imposing a wall of containment against the Soviets as the Fulda Gap in NATO was in Western Europe. Now, there have been alternative views. There have been contested uh, strategic uh, views <coughs> um, after Theodore Roosevelt stepped down, his successor, uh, Taft, um, uh, thought that China was more important and was deeply distrustful of the Japanese. Um, in the 19, late 1920s and into the 30s, the State Department Asia uh, office was dominated by a man named Stanley Hornbeck, who was deeply hostile to Japan um, and thought also that U.S. Uh, positions in China and keeping China open were the key to stability in the Pacific. Um, it was Hornbeck who told President Roosevelt that sanctioning Japan in the summer of 1941 would not cause Japan to attack the U.S. No country would ever attack over sanctions. Um, in the period when I was at graduate school, there were very strong alternative uh, hypotheses about the alliance and about Japan and about American security being put forward. Um, as I mentioned, um, the idea that the future was about techno-nationalism, that the Japanese economic model is a threat to the Anglo-American model, that security was now going to be different. I would argue that in many ways the sort of Sekigahara or Gettysburg, the sort of turning point in this century-long intellectual debate came when President Clinton and Prime Minister Hashimoto in April 1996 agreed on the Joint Security Declaration, which opened up a new era in American strategic thinking about Japan, the one we're still in, uh, that a U.S.-Japan alliance is fundamental to American security in Asia. And in effect, uh, in that security, uh, joint security declaration, um, reaffirming but also redefining and strengthening the alliance in the tradition of Perry, Mahan, Kennan, Reagan, Schultz. <clears throat> and that that largely, although it's debated and contested, is the mainstream view now in both Republican and Democratic administrations. On the Japanese side, of course, the post-war mainstream view was dominated by Yoshida Shigeru. Yoshida was also a realist in his own way, and he embraced I would argue, um, Japan's pacifism after the war and the instincts of the American reformers in the occupation, the New Deal reformers who wanted a more pacifist Japan, and he supported Article 9 of the Constitution and said the people on the right wing of the LDP who want to get rid of Article 9 are idiots, they're fools, and the diet would yell back at all at, uh, at, at both the left and the right who were opposing him. <clears throat> I would argue, not because Yoshida was an idealist, but because he was the penultimate realist at the time, and wanted to use Article 9 to ensure that Japan was never entrapped in an American war. So Thucydides argues, and political scientists claim that they've uh, discovered, although really Thucydides did over 2,000 years ago, the idea that smaller allies are always vulnerable. And they face this dilemma. If they get too close to the big ally, they can be entrapped in wars they don't want. But if they try to stay too distant, they can be abandoned and left alone in a hostile environment facing China or North Korea or Sparta, as Thucydides wrote. And I think that Yoshida's fundamental understanding was that he could use the restrictions on the alliance cooperation to ensure Japan avoided entrapment and could focus on developing the economy. And that became uh, the mainstream view in Japan, the so-called Shiryuha, um, uh, the Tanaka faction, uh, Sato, back to Yoshida, that was the dominant view in the LDP, um, and void entrapment with the U.S. Now, there were exceptions. There was Sato Sizaburo at Tora Aya studied under, and then Kosaka Masatake at Kyoto University, who Nakanishi studied under, and it, by all accounts is his uh, heir uh, in that intellectual tradition of realism. So there were exceptions. There was, Nak there was Kishi, Abe's grandfather, who revised the security treaty with the U.S., Nakasone, uh, Reagan's partner. But, but for most of the Cold War and early post-Cold War period, the Yoshida doctrine, the mainstream, was dominant. What has happened, I think, since 96 is that things have reversed. And what was the mainstream view is now the minority view within the conservative ranks that rule Japan. And that the Kishi, Nakasone, Kosaka, um, Sato Sizabara view is now the dominant foreign policy <coughs> philosophy in Japan. And that um, rather than uphold all these obstacles to alliance cooperation to preserve Japan's autonomy of action, it is better in the tradition of Kishi or Nakasone 
to do what the British do and do what the Australians do, which is bond with the Americans so that you can guarantee that they'll be there for you, be there for the US so that you have more security and control over your future. And to me, the kind of the most striking example of this was the way that the advisory group on collective self-defense described uh, the main purpose of uh, changing the exercise of the right of collective defense as it's seen in the, in the um, Constitution. So as you know, many of you, they did not change, strictly speaking, the Article 9 interpretation. They said still Japan should maintain the minimal amount of defense necessary. What they did was change the definition of the minimal amount of defense necessary to include collective self-defense with key allies who are important for Japan's security. And the crux of that interpretation was allowing Japan to participate in the use of force, Budokoshi no Itaika, which was one of the pillars of the mainstream um, use of Article 9 to prevent integration with US-Japan alliance, the way we are integrated with Korea or NATO or Australia. Britain. Um, and it's very explicit in this advisory group if you look for it. And in all the debates with the Clean Government Party, in all the debates with the, with the media, the one thing that has been sh saved has been the right to participate in the use of force, Buryo Kokoshi no Itaikan. Not to send Japanese troops, but information, intelligence sharing, uh, ISR, surveillance, <laughs> to have in effect the kind of jointness and interoperability that characterize US alliances with NATO uh, or with Korea. And I don't think this is going to change. Um, if you look at the Prime Ministers, Hashimoto, I would say, was very much, this was where he was heading. Although he was from the mainstream Tanaka faction. Definitely Kuizumi, definitely Abe. Um, Fukuda, more moderate, but not opposed to this general trend. Um, uh, Aso, although he's a grandson of Yoshida, very much in this line. <coughs> uh, Hatoyama, whatever. <laughs> um, Khan, interesting footnote. Um, uh, Noda, same tradition. Um, and then, of course, Abe. And if you look at who might succeed Abe, there's nobody who will fundamentally contest this direction. There are differences with Abe on history, uh, on relations with China. But I don't think there's any major political figure who's likely to replace him who's going to contest this. So I think we've reached this point where we are now um, uh, really um, looking at the challenges and opportunities of consolidating the alliance in terms of what Patrick Cronin and I wrote um, in 1999 in a book uh, would be the virtual, the virtual joint and combined U.S. Japan alliance, which we thought, you know, people thought we were crazy, but we said, you know, 10 years, this could be, could be where, we're, where we're heading. Now, there are challenges, and I'll end with these, and I think they're going to take a lot of effort. Um, I... Although I don't think there are competing schools of strategic thought in Japan that have much traction, the sort of liberal internationalist uh, view, the multilateral diplomatic uh, East Asia community view is quite popular. But we at CSIS have done surveys of, the, of elites in 10 countries in Asia. You can find them on our website. When we ask, would you rely on East Asia community, Asian Regional Forum, any of these institutions for your security? The intellectual leaders, about 50 to 100 in each country, who were most skeptical, Japan. So although there's a lot of um, noise about multilateralism and, and, and the East Asia community, and it should be an aspirational goal for all of us, in reality, it has the least traction in Japan of anywhere. Um, the idea of, um, the one that worries me the most, if there's an alternate view, is the idea that Japan can just kick back and relax. So, <clears throat> Uh, in the uh, mid-90s, uh, as the LDP broke up, there was a party called the Sakigake, the Harbinger Party, led by a man named Takimura. He wrote a book, which no one remembers, but it really stuck in my craw, called Chisakutomo um, Kikari to Hikarukuni, A Small But Shining Country. And he basically argued, you don't have to try hard, Japan. We've got all these assets. We've got all this wealth. We're aging, so there will be fewer people. So let's just retire as a country. Basically, that was his thesis. Let's retire. We'll play video games. You don't have to go abroad. You can buy everything you want in 7-Eleven. Um, you can even shower in 7-Eleven if you have to. Let's just stop trying. Let's just kick back. Let's be a tier, he didn't use these words, let's be a tier two country. Um, when Rich Armitage and Joe Nye and Kirk Campbell and a group of us wrote the um, second or third Armitage and I report in 2000, 
uh, and 12, we said Japan has to decide if it's going to be a tier two country. And Prime Minister Abe at, at uh, CSIS said, looking right at, at Rich Armitage, Japan is not now and will never be a tier two country. But I think that uh, alternate view, it's not a strategic view for shaping the world. It's not collect, it's not the idealistic sort of uh, East Asia community idea. It's not Gaullist. It's basically isolationist and inward. That is still alive. That worries me. But I think the internationalists are essentially now dominated by this realist view. But it's not the end of history, and there are a lot of question marks. So, one of the, so what do we have to worry about? Well, this new uh, virtually joint, combined, integrated future we're heading into is going to cause a lot of uneasiness on both sides. Um, on the Japanese side, the fear of abandonment becomes more intense because um, this is uh, more of a reliance on the U.S. Um, the defense forces wanted to do planning for so-called gray zone scenarios in the Senkaku Islands. What does Japan do if China's use of Coast Guard and PLA ships goes to the next level? The Pacific Command was very reluctant to do that on our side. Why? They were afraid of being entrapped. So now it's the U.S. side that's worrying about being entrapped. Um, we weren't used to talking in these terms. When the U.S. thinks about phase, phase zero, as you would call it, non-warfare, sort of short of war, coercive activities, we tend to think about a range of tools, diplomatic, economic. The Japanese side wanted to know, what's our military strategy? And the Pacific Command was hesitant to go right to military tools. So we don't, we're not used to talking to each other in this space. Um, it's exacerbated, frankly, by the disconnect between the White House and the Prime Minister's <coughs> office. Uh, which is real. Um, the military strategy, the, 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 the diplomatic strategy, has to flow from a common strategic picture between the leaders and especially the NSCs. I don't think that common picture is very strong right now. Um, I think there's a certain amount of distrust of Prime Minister Abe because of um, his ideology uh, from a government here that's essentially center, center left. Um, and I think the U.S. doesn't have an articulated strategy. The don't make mistakes is not a strategy that allies can really work with. Um, and the articulation of our Asia strategy keeps changing. On Monday, it's the Xin Xin Dego Quan Shi, Xin Gata Taiko Kukake, the new model of great power relations, which Xi Jinping articulated, which deliberately downgrades Japan and India and Korea and Australia to second tier. And the great powers are China, Russia, and the U.S. Hmm. How could we embrace? How could we do that? On other days. Uh, it's a pivot. We're quite robust. And then on other days, uh, it's a different theme. Uh, the White House announced yesterday that um, National Security Advisor Rice is going to spend three days in China. She's not going to Japan or Korea. These kinds of things matter. So our signal and our sort of overall strategic line is very confusing for allies, so it's on us too. Um, I think we're going to have to um, align our strategy. I think the U.S. is going to have to be a little bit more sensitive to Japanese requests to see the deterrent edge of our policy, whether it's extended deterrence, nuclear umbrella, or dealing with gray zones. We're going to have to be forthcoming uh, and listen and uh, address these things. Frankly, the Japanese side is going to have to understand that strategy requires not just deterrence, but also reassurance. Uh, that a Japanese strategy that, ha that, 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 it, that, that is premised on trying to improve relations with Korea and China is consistent with a strategy that's designed to deter and dissuade China. In other words, that um, uh, an Abe grant strategy that's not just focused on deterrence, but focused on avoiding escalation, needs to be articulated to Washington to reassure Washington. So we, we have work to do. <clears throat> um, ultimately, uh, the US bet on Japan depends on the Japanese economy in large part. And not, not going to any sense, we talked about that. Uh, TPP, which may come up in the q and is going to be critical. And, um, although at the national level there's pretty robust support in Japan for U.S. forward presence and there is progress on Okinawa and on the Guam relocation, um, uh, that's going to be a perennial uh, challenge for us, especially uh, as we go to the November election in Okinawa. So there's, there's work to do. Um, and there's no room for complacency. In some ways, uh, the increasing interoperability, jointness, and interdependence of U.S. Japan on each other 
uh, puts an even higher premium on thinking through these problems jointly and coming up with a strategy that we both understand. And we're not quite there yet. So I'll end on that. Thank you. We've had two fantastic presentations, from, uh, Professor McAleesh and Dr. Green. Uh, because we have about half an hour left um, in this session, I want to make sure that we have time for questions and answer. Um, so before I open it up, though, to the phase, I just ask that um, if you do have a question, you wait for the microphone, that you uh, identify yourself and your institution. Um, and you can ask any question related to our alliance. Just make sure that at the end it ends with a question mark and not an exclamation point. Um, so for those of you, uh, I guess we can start the Q&A uh, first if anybody has a question. Uh, uh, the gentleman here uh, with the view on the hat. Well, I'm Andre Silvazo, and I'm the uh, partner and chief representative in, Viet in Vietnam for the Interstate Traveler Company, which is designed to magnetic levitation high-speed rail, which ensures I'll be here tomorrow for <laughs> that. Now, the question I have, they want a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, my question I, uh, so, uh, is on TPP. Uh, it just seems that it's, it's such an important uh, component not only of trade relations but geopolitically relevant to everything that you've been discussing and so I, my question is uh, to whoever wants to mention but I think it, it fits your presentation uh, Mike um, is given the formidable obstacles to doing it in both Japan and the United States in in the United States the obstacle is that so much of the of the center left that is so supportive of President Obama, of President Obama, are opposing it because of, I think, misunderstanding um, um, that it's going to be bad for the American working man and, and all the protectionist arguments. And then, and then in Japan, it seems like it's a protectionism that in, in Japanese markets. So, what? What's the prognosis for overcoming that? And, and how can both sides work to resolve those obstacles? So um, if my colleagues at USGI and NPR will f forgive a plug, um, on September 18th, uh, CSIS and the US Chamber of Commerce are doing a big conference at the Chamber on TPP. <clears throat> and we're um, inviting uh, former US trade reps from both parties uh, former national security advisors from both parties and uh, business leaders to talk about why TPP is important because in our view this fall we've got to make the push if we're going to get this done. <clears throat> um, typically uh, before these trade agreements go to Congress the president whether it was George Herbert Walker Bush, Bill Clinton or George W. Bush um, made the case for trade promotion authority or what was called fast track because the Constitution requires that. Um, the one exception was um, uh, uh, President Bush pushed through a free trade agreement with, I think it was Jordan, in 2001 after 9 11 uh, because he said Jordan's in the front lines in the war on terror, we got to support him. That's the one exception. So that's the norm. What President Obama has chosen to do is get the deal. Uh, with Japan as the biggest of the partners, but of course also Vietnam and the other uh, and the other partners, and then go to the Congress and say, "This is a great deal. Give me the authority um, to push this through." That might work. In fact, politically in the U.S., it probably would work. But there's a big problem with it, and the big problem is the other guys also get a vote, and our trading partners, uh, not just Japan, by the way. Um, are not going to give their best deal on sensitive issues like agriculture until they see that the American president is also putting some skin in the game. Um, and so saying, give us, it's sort of like, uh, uh, you know, I gladly pay you on Tuesday for a hamburger today. You know, we're saying, give us your best deal and trust us, we're going to get the Congress to support it. So I don't think that's going to work. It's not going to work. And so um, the best case scenario would be if uh, the president 
um, makes the case, I don't think he has to get TPA politically, but makes a strong case. However, he's clearly not going to do that before the midterms because um, the Democrats would, are just simply don't want to do anything that makes their hard job harder in terms of retaining the Senate, particularly since Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader, is vocally opposed to TPP. But if the Republicans take the Senate, the best case, I think, is uh, the White House communications guys and political guys wake up and with their 48, 24, 48 hour news cycle heads realize we just got shellacked. Everyone is going to say the president is dead in the water. Our first overseas trip coming up in a, less than two weeks is to Asia. So we've got to have some deliverables. And in that sort of two week period, if the president starts making the case for GPA and TPP, does what he hasn't done, which is speak, call members of Congress, call Boehner, call McConnell if he wins, or call Harry Reid if the Democrats retain the Senate, and start making the case to show Abe in particular, but the other partners who are all going to be there at APEC, um, that we're moving fast. And if that happens, we have a shot at getting it next year, first half of next year. If after the election there's radio silence, I won't <coughs> bet on it at all. That's, that's my view. Yeah, uh, uh, adding to uh, what uh, Dr. V just said, uh, from the Japanese point of view, uh, uh, of course the American politics, particularly the midterm election, is important. And so uh, uh, the, probably the other cabinet is waiting for the midterm election. And then we have the APEC at Beijing, and then G20 and ASEAN plus three or ASEAN plus six meeting uh, uh, this year. So all those, uh, you know, uh, things are combined at, at that uh, period, and I think uh, uh, Abe is watching uh, on, on the kind of international uh, setting how uh, this unfolds. At the same time, uh, the for the LDP, the, the ruling party, uh, agriculture uh, used to be the, one of the key uh, 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 vote uh, constituents. Uh, so. Uh, it had to uh, uh, do a lot of persuading in, in order to liberalize uh, or uh, decrease the protection on, on agriculture. Uh, but I think things are moving, uh, even though it's slowly, but it's moving uh, because uh, the uh, Japanese farmers and the agriculture sec sectors uh, came to re realize that there is not much a bright future even if we continue this protection because of the uh, labor shortage. Uh, there is a very serious uh, shortage of the, the farmers within Japan. Uh, the, probably the average number of the uh, full-time working farmer is more, uh, is more than 60 years old uh, in Japan. So uh, uh, just with uh, it, it's impossible to, to uh, protect the current status quo. So we need a kind of reform. But at the same time, we have to do a kind of you know, persuading the uh, cost, uh, constituents, particularly the uh, rural areas uh, where there are not much uh, uh, in industries or, or the working places. So uh, those things are also combined as a domestic package of how to revitalize local uh, protection. So I think those, all those things are uh, put into a kind of you know, combined uh, uh, political agenda uh, so that uh, hopefully things can uh, go forward late, uh, late this year or uh, early next year. Can I have two quick mm -hmm. points I'd, I'd like to add? Just because the TPP is really very, very important to Japan and the U.S. and the future of the Pacific region. One, that Pew polls recently and other polls by the Chicago Council in the past, in the recent years, have shown that a majority of Americans support TPP. Um, Chicago Council on Global Affairs, two years ago, they have a new poll coming out soon, um, uh, showed that uh, over 70% of Americans thought Japan was a fair uh, trader and that we should have a trade deal with Japan. Um, so the politics and, and the votes are there in the Congress. So it's really whether or not the White House wants to prioritize it and how well the Republicans are willing to play. Um, the second point is, uh, it, you know, it's not just on the president. If, and I don't think the TPA is, it's not going to happen before TPP. That's just not the president's strategy. So if, if, if the president makes some big moves before going to Japan and Abe doesn't pick up on them, it's going to be very bad for Japan because failure to get TPP is going to be seen as a vote of no confidence in the third arrow of restructuring the Japanese economy. And I think investors uh, will vote with their feet, so to speak. And so it's really critical for Abe to, if he gets some opening, to move. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Thank you. I'm Mark Wall, a former U.S. Foreign Service officer now with the University of Wyoming. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Nakanishi-san to comment on one of Mike Green's uh, main points, uh, that the um, kind of predominant view in Japan now is in support of a, a conservative, pro-defense, pro-U.S. alliance uh, uh, approach. Uh, two aspects of that I'd like you to comment on. One, uh, do you believe that's the correct interpretation? Or is the more isolationist uh, Japan as a second tier uh, power, um, does that have legs um, as well? Uh, the second aspect of that I'd like you to comment on is um, kind of under the flip side of that. And that is, is this more pro-defense approach uh, really just a cover, a, a front for resurgence of right-wing uh, militaristic nationalism in Japan, as uh, some in the region would uh, suspect. <clears throat> Thank you for a very uh, a good question. Uh, the, the first aspect you mentioned, the, either the uh, realist, you know, the victory, the, uh, according to uh, Dr. Green, is uh, 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 look up is right from my perspective. Well, well, I, I think it generally agree with uh, Dr. Green uh, in the sense that there is no uh, viable or uh, sort of rationalistic alternative to this, uh, you know, uh, pro-defense, uh, more active uh, foreign policy uh, 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 option uh, for Japan, particularly after the 2009-2011 uh, turning point. I, I mentioned uh, Japanese people generally are uh, kind of you know, get worried that Japan is just you know in the declining course and being just a, a part of history rather than you know current politics or the future prediction part. Uh, so uh, on on that score, uh, I think the uh, the support towards the pro defense is uh, uh, probably the, the one uh, most viable option. Having said that, I think it's uh, quite related to uh, the future of the Japanese economy. That's why I mentioned uh, a lot about the uh, future of economics. Uh, and the, you know, uh, the, everything hinges on uh, whether Japan can go through the period of the demographic shrinkage and the huge uh, fiscal uh, debt accumulation. And, and so forth. So uh, you cannot just talk about uh, defense or the uh, foreign policy. You need to combine that aspect with the uh, uh, domestic economic policy, uh, fiscal situation, uh, social uh, policy, and so forth. So uh, unless uh, economics or any other alternative e economy uh, really e succeeds in uh, bringing up the uh, reasonable stability in uh, Japanese economy and the social situation, uh, this pro or defense policy may not be sus sustainable uh, in the mid or long term future. That's my first point. The second, uh, the, the question of covering uh, the, uh, the you know right wing uh, militaristic uh, maybe instinct or the uh, uh, or, or, or the cra uh, 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 cravings. Uh, 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 behind this uh, rationalistic, realist approach. Well, uh, I, uh, I don't quite, uh, quite agree that there is that kind of, you know, uh, behind the uh, covert uh, scenarios. Uh, true that uh, uh, the supporters of Abe or some sections of Japan talking about uh, the re historical revisionism or the, uh, you know, the, the, even the uh, honor and pride of the Japanese uh, military uh, uh, military record and history, uh, but uh, those things are more of the uh, more of the uh, sentiment and the romantic uh, uh, talkings rather than uh, having political uh, significance. And uh, 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 even today, the uh, Article 9 uh, of the Japanese Constitution has. Uh, more than uh, I think 80% of the support as the symbol of pacifism. 
uh, and the, uh, even uh, those you know realist uh, uh, people agree that the post war Japan uh, the best or the core uh, value is the uh, the pacifism, pacifism. Like Abe is saying, maybe we are moving from the passive pacifism or one country pacifism towards the more active or more engaged pacifism. But uh, the, the, with this, you know, shrinking and uh, aging demography, it's just uh, uh, stupid to, to talk about the aggressive warfare uh, 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 abroad. So uh, those uh, basically what I think is the, the, the talk of the right wing or the militaristic sentiment is more of the romantic uh, noble story rather than any political uh, hidden agenda. Thank you. My name is Kunio Kikuchi and I'm with uh, Washington Research and Analysis, a small information company. But um, you touched on just recently, um, Professor Nakanishi, about the uh, accumulated deficit. Uh, in your first presentation, part of the presentation you mentioned as part of the success, the weakening of the yen from uh, 85 yen to the dollar to 100 yen or 105 yen today uh, as part of the success and that the stock prices went up uh, from say 8,000 level to 14,000. But it seems to me like economics 101. Uh, if you print a lot of money, pump it into the economy, it has to go somewhere. The value of the yen goes down, just as the value of the dollar went down prior to that effort with a QE2 and pumping a lot of money. That means that the stock price go up because there's no other place to put the money in. And those who have stocks, mainly the wealthy people, uh, reap the benefits. Uh, yesterday, the budget was passed. It was 40, 100 trillion yen, uh, the largest ever. And the bureaucracies, people live in a different planet because it ends up with a 41% deficit. Is there any concern in Japan on what to do and what the future projections are? How long more can Japan continue to just finance its uh, budget with deficits? Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for the difficult question. And uh, I'd like to, to pass that difficult question to probably the more expert people coming in uh, in the economic field. Uh, but uh, just a uh, uh, short instinctive answer, maybe wrong, but uh, my, my answer is that uh, uh, as to the e debate or the concern of this sustainability of the Japanese huge fiscal deficit, no doubt it's huge. 200% uh, of GDP, it's a very huge the size, like the wartime period uh, scale. Uh, so uh, uh, there, there is uh, no doubt a lot of uh, discussions. Generally, uh, every economist agrees it's, it's uh, not sustainable, sustainable in a long-term future uh, if it goes this way. Uh, but there is a wide range of disagreement. Uh, how long it, it is sustainable? And, uh, uh, and also there is a wide divergence of how we can get out of this. Uh, basically, the Abenomics supporters said uh, we go for the uh, economic growth first, uh, then we can start reducing the uh, economic deficit. Then the, uh, someone like uh, Noda or Tanigaki were more the fiscal conservatives uh, who says that we need to uh, raise uh, taxes uh, in order to start reducing the amount of fiscal deficit. Uh, those things have been debated for a long time, uh, and uh, I think we end up, ended up with this economics because uh, every other alternative in the last 15 years or 20 years failed. Uh, so we are going towards the what Prime Minister Abe calls the uh, uh, extra-dimensional uh, uh, scale of the uh, uh, financial uh, expansion. Uh, and uh, it, uh, as I, as you mentioned. It uh, seems to be working so far, uh, but uh, uh, like I said, I think it's uh, uh, right now it's a uh, difficult uh, timing. Whether we need to uh, go even further, uh, extra-dimensional uh, 
financial expansion or a large scale fiscal expansion, even uh, risking the uh, still larger you know, uh, fiscal uh, accumulation, fiscal debt to stimulate uh, economy. Or uh, we you need to uh, backtrack and uh, go uh, raise consumption tax and uh, uh, seriously uh, uh, reducing the uh, uh, fiscal deficit. Uh, that's a uh, uh, long line of debate which I cannot uh, venture into uh, uh, explaining or let alone uh, you know, judging. Uh, but uh, 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 even though I'm a uh, foreign policy and uh, a security, ex uh, security field person, uh, I think this you know, fiscal and economic uh, uh, issue is uh, the, the, the most fundamental. Uh, challenge Japan faces uh, in terms of uh, even the foreign and economic, uh, uh, foreign and uh, security uh, policy. Okay. Real quick, uh, um, to economics with some care, but um, you know the Japanese debt to GDP ratio hit 220 percent a few years ago, and international investors were buying yen like crazy. Why? Because the U.S., European, and other economies were a little wobbly after the recession, and because investors knew that. At that point, something like 90% of the debt was held by Japanese, so that it was a fairly safe investment. Um, uh, and then the quantitative easing you mentioned, especially by the US, but also Korea, because the yuan is essentially pegged to the dollar in Europe, meant that Japan's uh, economy was, was, un was unnaturally uncompetitive. So I think what Kuroda san of the Bank of Japan has done is basically bring the Japanese um, monetary policy back into the international mainstream. It's not a radical move, in my view, although it's sold as economics and sounds radical, <laughs> and it's pretty reasonable. And the fundamentals still apply in terms of the um, solidity of the Japanese economy. But as Nakanishi said, and as many economists point out, nobody knows how long this can last. And that's why I, I think TPP is so essential for Japan, not just the US, but especially for Japan, to get moving on because this uh, next year, the ability of Japan to move on the agriculture sector in particular and on TPP is going to be a real litmus test uh, for, uh, for structural reform, without which um, it, it's going to be hard, very hard down the road to deal with the problem. Kate Lee from the Center for Naval Analyses. And um, first of all, I have an easier question. In uh, both your presentations, uh, you mentioned the Okinawa gubernatorial election as a challenge. But I was wondering if um, both of you would be willing to characterize how important you think that election is and how important an Okinawa loss would be for um, both the Abe government and the US Japan alliance. Maybe you know better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, well, uh, uh, the uh, 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 governor Nakaima uh, kind of, you know, uh, admitted the uh, starting of the uh, 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 the construction of the uh, replacement base of the Futema uh, Marine Air Base. Uh, so uh, even Nakaima uh, loses in the coming election. Uh, theoretically, uh, it may not be damaging. Uh, as it used to be, uh, because the uh, things are already moving ahead. And uh, there is a sort of legal question whether uh, even the left-wing uh, governor uh, wins, uh, he, he, probably he, he can rescind uh, the uh, uh, permission uh, which the uh, Nakaima already gave uh, to the construction business. Having, having said that, uh, if the uh, left-wing uh, or the there is a, there are uh, alternative candidate, I mean competitive uh, candidate towards Nakaima, even from the LDP uh, supporters. Uh, so there is, seems to be at least three uh, major contending uh, 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 candidates in this uh, gubernatorial election, and even the uh, the non Nakaima uh, candidate uh, uh, wins. That sends the signal that the uh, uh, Okinawa is not happy with this, you know, 
relocation uh, project. And so the, uh, both the Japanese government as well as the U.S. government needs to uh, care uh, even more as to, uh, as to the sensitivity of the Okita people uh, towards the uh, base, uh, basement uh, construction and uh, other uh, uh, base affairs. Uh, so, uh, uh, no doubt, if, if the Nakaima loses, uh, that can be a blow to uh, other cabinet and his uh, policy line of strengthening the alliance with the uh, United States, and that can uh, have you know later impacts uh, towards the leadership of Abe uh, uh, in, in, in next year's uh, other elections or the uh, LDP uh, president uh, leadership election. I I agree with that. Legally, there's not much that the next governor can do if, um, if um, Nakaima loses because of the environmental impact statement, which is the key sort of um, <coughs> vote that the, that the government has in Okinawa on whether to proceed or not. That's done. So I think um, uh, legally there's nothing that can be done. But politically, the next governor can make it extremely difficult to proceed just because of the um, tone that's set. And if Nakaima loses, then uh, the other candidates going to have one on an anti um, gender replacement uh, Hinoko platform. Um, so I, I still think it can, it can and probably will move ahead the project, um, but uh, but we should, you can't be complacent about it. So I think the it will be important for the U.S. side to move forward on the Guam relocation. Remember, we're promising to cut essentially in half the number of Marines, and the Pentagon's ready to go, and the Congress has got to approve some of the military construction to start building marine barracks in Guam and things like that. And that would be a good signal uh, to send uh, before too long that things are moving forward in terms of reducing the presence on Okinawa. And then the second thing is, um, you know, the, um, the next governor, if it's not Nakima, is not going to want to run against Okinawa all the time. He's going to want to build the economy. He's not going to wait, want to spend all his political capital on a mission impossible. Um, and so he, I predict, will come up with some, some demands uh, about Osprey or other things. And I think the, the, the Pentagon and the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance managers have got to have some things ready to, to be flexible. Um, maybe about deployments of Ospreys or other things. I don't want to get into the weeds because they're operational considerations. Um, but uh, under Abe, we have a real opportunity to implement some, some options. Um, and and uh, my sense is the Pentagon knows this, and uh, Abe knows it, um, and they won't be complacent. But uh, if they are, they're going to be in trouble. Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, Mike Cassetti, PBS Online News Hour. Does the development, the future development of the U.S.-Japanese alliance? hinge exclusively or partially on having a common view of China. And what is that view? That we should stop them from being a red regional hegemon, or is it something else? Mike Green indicated that we seem to change our view on that uh, monthly or daily. Uh, so how do you plug China into this? Are we talking a triangular relationship, or quadrangular with India, or Russia, or whatever? Well, um, the reality is that China is the organizing principle around which this alliance is being built and has been for at least a decade, probably 15 years. Um, but that said, this is not an alliance designed to contain China. And so the two sides, I think, broadly have a view that we continue to um, pursue a China policy that um, integrates China uh, into the global economy as a what Bob Zella called a responsible stakeholder, you know, a country that's contributing to stability, not just taking and taking, and that's across the board, including development assistance or North Korea policy, that we want to see China do more because it has the leverage uh, to, to play a bigger and bigger role, and we're not trying to limit China's power, we're trying to shape how China uses its power, uh, and we want to dialogue and work with Beijing to find win-win solutions to that. But at the same time, <clears throat> um, uh, China has increasingly shown a willingness to use coercive power, mercantile, military, paramilitary, <clears throat> um, to get what it wants from smaller states. And the US and Japan, I think, are both seized with this and have a common view. We have to have a 
a strategy that deters and dissuades China from thinking coercion will work. But we don't know exactly what that strategy is yet. It involves certainly networking with other, other countries like Australia, India, Vietnam. It involves, as I said, some reassurance with China, some dialogue, some ways to avoid escalation if we can. Um, uh, we don't have a consistent line in the US, and we don't have a consistent line between the US and Japan. Um, I think part of that is because, I'm going to sound very partisan, but we don't have a particularly strong Asia, leadership, Asia team in the leadership in, of the second Obama administration the way we did in the first. Um, and China looks differently when you're a global power versus a regional power. Rising powers, historically, Germany, Japan, us, are revisionist regionally and they free ride globally. So what the U.S. tends to see is a China that's revisionist in Asia, but we're also focused on China's free riding globally. We want China to do more on climate change and on development. Whereas for Japan, the, region, the revisionism regionally, trying to reorder things, uh, especially around maritime territory disputes, to China's favor, that's right in Japan's face. That's the paramount concern. And that China as a global player and not free riding is, is, is not as, as, vi so, as vital. So, Japan's physically just closer to it, and it's in Japan's face, and the coercion is right there. For us, we're looking at global management of the global system, so there's, there's always going to be some gap in how the U.S. and Japan view China, just as there's a gap between how the U.S. and Israel view Iran or, you know, any other regional ally. That's sort of structurally built into the dialogue. We need to know that. We need to have a strategy that's not, that we need a global strategy, which we don't have. We need a regional strategy, which we have, but the way we describe it changes. Um, uh, the president doesn't like strategy. <laughs> um, Abe loves strategy. Uh, I don't know if that can get fixed in the next two years, uh, but that's sort of the problem. Well, I uh, agree that uh, uh, even though the uh, U.S. and Japan should share the sort of the common picture, because of the CR, you know, difference of the proximity uh, uh, of China, Maybe Japan and uh, the U.S. has some divergence, but the, uh, I think the the, the uh, another problem is that uh, China in itself is in a, a very crossroad. Uh, I think the, the period of the Chen Shaoping, you know, openness and uh, uh, reform period is uh, basically over. Uh, it's uh, a become more you know politically oriented and more. Uh, uh, Articulated uh, country, and I think I think it's natural in a, a fundamental sense. Uh, but having said that, using the coercive force, particularly in the maritime uh, uh, area, is uh, probably not the uh, best interest of of, of China. Uh, so uh, I think it's uh, 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 there. There uh, is naturally a kind of uh, divergence of the uh, view on China in Japan and the U.S. Uh, probably Japan is a little bit too fixated on Ch Chinese threat. Uh, uh, that's my uh, my view. But anyway, uh, we need to have uh, 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 several uh, scenarios for the future of the uh, of China. And I think uh, both the uh, Japan and the United States uh, try to uh, not only engage with China but try to persuade uh, uh, China uh, for the improvement of their uh, uh, their own good, uh, which is not uh, conflicted. Uh, or, uh, or conflicting with the uh, uh, Japanese or, uh, or, or the American interests. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions. Uh, thank you again to you.